record. Okay, so hermeneutic tradition coming from the Greek word hermeneos, interpreter, asserts basically that social science should be concerned with the clarification of meaning and conceptual connections rather than with causal explanation. This is very important. These guys basically assert that social science is not actually a science as the natural sciences because natural sciences are concerned with causal explanations, cause and effect relations, you know, scientific regularity, empirical regularities, laws, etc., etc. But social science is about interpretation of the category of meaning. What is meaning? Meaning of the action is an ambiguous term, ranging from what is conscious and individually intended to what is communally and often unintendedly significant. So it's, it's an ambiguous term. For example, Winch, Peter Winch, influenced by Wittgenstein, basically, he argues that the basic category in social science is the notion of meaning, and this meaning refers to some rule-following behavior. Rules are important in constituting the society in general. It's something like this, you know, if you are like me, for example, you can never understand, well, I shouldn't say that, I have never understood the rules of American football. You know, they call it football and we call it American football. I've never understood what's going on there. Many times, some people, mostly Americans, try to explain me, but you know, I still have no idea what's going on. So if you don't know about the rules of the game, this is another category actually, which can be applied to society in general, you know, Wittgensteinian notion again, language games, something like that. Society is like a game, and if you understand, if you want to understand society, you should learn about the rules in the first place. So if you don't know about the rules of American footballs like me, you can never understand what's going on in the field, right? So the rule following behavior, according to Winch, is important in social science. Well, we shouldn't call it science, but it's social endeavor, maybe. Social study, whatever you say. So basically, the aim in social science, according to this tradition, is not to include human action under a causal law, you know, the law of demand and that and this, but to discover the rules or goals or meaning which guide the action and render it meaningful. And the effort for understanding these rules requires interpretation. So rule following behavior requires interpretation. As you start interpreting, you can get a clear knowledge or better knowledge of the society, what's going on. So through interpretation, you can start understanding society. Here understanding is different from explaining the causal relations among different atomistic events, for example. It's about interpreting the rules or the notion of meaning that is important in understanding the society or social rules, social institutions as a whole. In other words, hermeneutical approach treats social phenomena as a text to be decoded through imaginative reconstruction of the significance of the various elements of the social action. There are some different accounts within the hermeneutical tradition in general. And one of them is Ludwig Wittgenstein, inspired by the Ludwig Wittgenstein's, basically his philosophical investigations, not the earlier work. It uses the notion of a game in discussing human action. The rules of a game not only regulate how it is played, but more importantly, define or constitute the game itself. A society is constituted through the actions of individuals, and these actions are based upon what individuals think about what they are doing. 
So society is not independent of the notions or self-understanding of the individuals. It's conceptual in character. This is the main difference between the subject matter of the natural science in general and social science. Our subject matter is society in general, but this society is not independent about what we think of the society itself. So moves in again have meaning only within the rules. For instance, words have meaning only within a language and within practices of communication. So Peter Winch argues that social sciences are concerned with meaningful or rule-following behavior. This program argues that social phenomena can only be rendered intelligible, can be represented as maintaining some interrelated theses. First, individual actions can only be understood through interpretations. Individuals are not simple atoms or inert matters. They are active agents at the same time. There's a radical diversity across cultures concerning the way in which social life is conceptualized, and this differences creates diverse social worlds. The notion of culture is basically a hermeneutical notion. Culture is a framework of reference in general, which makes our behavior, those of us who belong to this specific culture, meaningful in general. You know, the meaningful behavior in some cultures may not be seen as meaningful in others. So there is this cultural diversity and cultural differences, etc., etc. So this is a hermeneutical insight. Uh, radical diversity across cultures, about social life, etc. And social practices are constituted by the meanings that participants attribute to them. And therefore, there are no brute atomistic facts in the social science. They are culture-specific dependency of the culture, dependency of concept, concept dependence, basically. So there's no such thing as facts in the social sciences, because facts do differ according to culture, according to different frames or frameworks of meaning, etc., etc. So this is the famous idea you know, famous picture used by Thomas Kuhn in his book. Is this a duck or a rabbit? Everything depends on your interpretation, on your understanding. Some people would see a duck and some, like myself, may see a rabbit here. Because the way I see the picture depends on my conceptual framework which is before the picture, actually. You know, it's what Schumpeter calls, for example, pre-analytic or pre-scientific vision. The vision is on my mind, and what I see depends on this vision itself. So this is the interpretation. This is another more modern version of this duck or rabbit thing. So there are some interesting examples about the importance of hermeneutic insights in social sciences. One of them is this Nakirama thing. This was taken from some anthropological study by Horace Minor, Body Ritual Among the Nakirama. It was published in 1956, an old one, but still is very amusing one, actually. So it's about Nakirama people living in North America, where I don't know, territory between the Canadian Cree, the Yaqui, and the somewhere in Mexico, whatever. So this is a very long, actually, uh, excerpts from this article. You can read it because it's, it's on the classroom thing, and also in the Evdekal thing of Hajatepe, whatever it is, model, yes. So who are these guys? These guys are actually, this is a long one, very amusing to read. Who are these people? The I answer is very simple. Just read the word Nakirema backwards, they are Americans. 
So this says basically, if you describe some particular society from a different perspective, from a different vision, different than your own, then you could not understand, you cannot understand what's going on here. So this is a very interesting example. As I said, I did not, I do not want to go into deeper and deeper to this article. You should read it. This is very interesting. And this, another example is more important, I think. It's about the uprising of the Maori people against British governor in New Zealand in 1844-1846. The whole revolt was about a certain poll. It's about a certain poll, likewise having to do with possession of the earth. The flagstaff flying the British colors above Kororakreka in the Bay of Island long the most populous European settlement, on four separate occasions between July 1844 and March 1845, the Maori rebel on a heke and his warriors of the Ngapuhi, I hope I'm saying right, tribe cut down that flag pole. They attack to the pole itself. Why? The British thinks that because they want to capture the flag. You know, the flag is on the pole, so if you capture the flag, you will create a victory against the British, right, in general. This is what their interpretation. But this is not true, as we can see. So, etc., etc. This is very interesting also. Kavite and his warriors were deployed to make an attack on the European settlement at Kororeka as a diversion so that Heke could go up the hill and take the flagpole. Their own mission accomplished. For their part, the British, if they did not attach exactly the same finality to the flagstaff, knew how to appreciate its symbolic value and to take the appropriate response of general panic. The government considered it an imperious necessity to show the colors of colors and provided the flag with greater protection upon each occasion of its replacement, the fourth time surrounding the pole with a stockade and blockhouse. There may have been some working misunderstanding here, since the Maori seem not at all as interested in the flag as they were in the pole. They don't care about the flag itself. Uh, at the third assault, for example, the leader, the rebel, was content to leave the flag itself in the hands of certain Maori families who had been set to guarding it, yet the blockers ultimately must have confirmed the rebel's interpretation. For the whole construction now plainly resembled a Maori tuahu, a fenced altar within which were erected one or several poles such as constituted the sacred precincts of Maori settlements and embodied their ancient claims to tribal lands. So here the difference is between the British and the Maori is this, the British see this, is, it's, it, the flag itself matters, so we should protect the flag because it has some symbol, symbolic value. But the Maori sees the pole as a representative of their temple, so they think that, you know, British also care about the religious meaning of this pole. So we should attack this temple, so to speak, and we should get it. It's a kind of victory. So there are two different understandings about the same thing, the pole. British sees it as the symbolic value of the nation itself. But on the other hand, the Maori people attaches to the block a kind of religious meaning. So this is quite interesting. This is an important explanation of the hermeneutical insight in general. So this is very interesting. Well, at least this is what I find interesting. So again, another idea that the Hermeneutic tradition says that in the social science, well, in the social study, we should say, value judgments are important because 
it is not possible to distinguish between positive and normative statements in the social science. Well, it is possible maybe in the natural sciences, but in the social sciences, the society itself or social practices themselves are constituted by the values, symbols, meanings, rules, etc. that constitute them. They are constituted by value judgments. And as a method, maybe we should use value judgments in the social study as well. So this is another example given by Roy Baskar in his Possibility of Naturalism. The example was actually taken from Isaiah Berlin. And it's about what happened in Germany under Nazi rule. The first proposition, the first explanation could be the country was depopulated, the population decreased. Well, yes, of course. The second, millions of people died. The third, millions of people were killed. And the last, but not the least, millions of people were massacred. All of them true, right? The first one is the most positive one, so to speak. You know, the country's population decreased. So this is what happened. But the last one, the millions of people were brutally murdered by some organized crime, organized crime in the case of Nazis, of course. So D is both most evaluative, uh, but it's also the best explanation, the most precise and accurate, right? Description of what actually happened. In virtue of this, all but D generate the wrong perlocutionary force. So value judgments may be and usually are important in social science. So it's, 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 it's the idea that economics is a positive science and there should be no place for the value judgments in economics, etc. doesn't make any sense or much sense because the very society itself is constituted by value judgments because what we call society cannot be independent of what the individuals think or value about what's going on in the society as well. But still, we can, from a methodological perspective, if you go back to our matrix, again, by Martin Hollis, even the understanding idea that is based upon the notion of hermeneutic tradition can be moving in two directions. One is the holistic directions. It's about games, you know, with Gamesteinian game of language games and etc. Or it could be again individualistic. What I'm saying is something like this, individualist hermeneutic approach is again similar to the method that was adopted by the Austrian School of Economics. You know, especially Ludwig von Mises and Frederick von Hayek embrace this idea. If you want to understand the society, you should start from the individual and individual motivations, individual evaluations, individual judgments, individual subjective expectations, etc. So subjectivity is important to a degree that they are sometimes called as radical subjectivism. So with respect to method again, again, here we go back to the distinction between individualism and holism, so to speak. So we can say that here two methods are possible. One is the holistic method, top down. The games absorb the players. If actors in their social capacities desire to live and therefore do only what is socially expected of them, then they need no separate understanding. If, for instance, they are solely the bearers of social roles, which derive entirely from determined social positions and dictate all that role players do, then understanding can proceed as wholly as a pure systems theory would have explanation proceeds. 
So this is a holistic understanding. You know, culture itself as a holistic category is important in determining even the actions of individuals. Or in general, there is this idea of social role, social acting. Actor means basically the guy who acts in this understanding, we can say. You know, we are, as individuals, trying only to play our part in a play. The play itself, the culture or the society or the social system in general, whatever. So we simply try to fulfill the expectations on the part of the society or some holistic authority, whatever it is. Holistic authorities, desires or expectations. Another method is again, as I said, in the Austrian School of Economics, individualist or bottom-up method. If meanings are subjective first and intersubjective only by mutual accord, an opposite account of understanding is needed. The players construct the games of social life, perhaps in the spirit of the social contract, often postulated to account for moral and political order. So in general, neoclassical general equilibrium theory can be seen as a variant of the social contract theory. Remember also the idea of invisible hand. It's a kind of explanation of emerging the order, social order that is based upon individual actions, individual behavior and their interactions, subjectivity and intersubjectivity thing. And Austrians, Austrian economists, emphasize the importance of subjective evaluations in the working of the economy in general, their expectations, etc. So basically, if you want to understand the game itself, so to speak, you should again start from the individual. So hermeneuticist approach by itself cannot prevent us from adopting a kind of methodological individualism. Again, in economics, the mainstream economics, the British and the French tradition, you know, general equilibrium tradition, and also the economics of Marshall and Jones is based upon some kind of positivistic, so to speak, kind of individualism. Whereas Austrian School of Economics, whose founder is Karl Menger, as you see, he's also the founder of the neoclassical economics in general. This Austrian economics usually adopts a kind of hermeneuticist approach. I mean, they are not radical hermeneuticists, even Hayek himself is not, but still they share these hermeneutical insights because they believe that if you want to understand the society, the first point to start is the subjective valuations of the individuals about what's going on, about what's how economy works, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But in general, we can distinguish among important points, important differences between modern science, or basically can read this as positivistic science, and hermeneutic approach. According to modern science, you know, they are in black, reality is uniform and regular. Again, we have only 10 minutes, but I think it's enough. It may seem heterogeneous, heterogeneous, but still it's uniform and regular. Same causes always create same effects. It's a cosmos and it conforms to reason. Whereas hermeneutical approach argues that nature is more like a chaos. Well, by nature here, we mostly talk about the social nature, but you know, some people may even extend this understanding it into nature itself, especially the postmodern approaches, basically. Nature is more like a chaos rather than cosmos. It's, an, it's not entirely uniform. Same causes may bring about different effects. So human account of causality as the constant conjunctions between atomistic events does not hold in this case. According to modern science, nature is hierarchical, whereas 
according to Hermeneticism, nature is not hierarchical. It is, it is formed by different layers, each of which is independent of the other and cannot be reduced to the other. So reductionism is not a question. Reality is mechanical in the positivistic approach, whereas according to Hermeneticist tradition, reality is mostly organic. It's not mechanic, it grows, develops, faints, collapses, redevelops, etc. The future is determined, so determinism is an important integral part of especially Newtonian physics, for example. But in the Hermeneutics tradition, we have, even if there's a part in nature that could be understood through reason, it's as essentially irrational. Well, this is a bit dangerous. Maybe we can discuss this in due course. We should discuss this, actually, the implications of this idea. Change in the reality is quantitative and cumulative. The mechanical order of the reality can be expressed with a universal language, which is mathematics. You know, remember Galileo says God is the greatest mathematician. But hermeneuticists believe that change in social reality is seldom quantitative and cumulative. It is rather qualitative and full of leaps, breaks, evolutions. It is evolutionary, constantly changes and transforms. Science is objective, whereas hermeneuticists believe that the subject can never be objective for the observation itself is theory laden or even it is theoretic. Without the guidance of the theory, the observer is completely blind. Universality of science is also rejected by the hermeneuticists. The products of social science are not necessarily universal and necessary for two reasons. One difference is in traditions, you know, remember Feyerabend? There are traditions in science, traditions are neither good nor bad, they simply are. So there are different forms of sciences, there are different methods for doing science, anything goes in science, in other words, and human intention is important. So I guess this is what I have to say today, maybe I should stop here.